Yes, fully. You guys sit. Sit. Isn't this cool? Oh my goodness. I'm thrilled. It's exciting to have these fabulous ladies and this gentleman here. But I want to welcome you guys to the White House. Yeah. We are uh, doing our latest installment of something we call the White House Music Series. And we're marking Women's History Month by celebrating women with a whole lot of soul. Mm hmm yeah. And I want to start by thanking the wonderfully talented women on the stage with me. You guys, I don't even, you know who they are. We've got Janelle Monet. <laughs> who is now my child. She might, we might as well give her a room here because she's here so much. Uh, Melissa Etheridge, who is amazing. We're thrilled to have her and my other mother, <laughs> the phenomenal Patti LaBelle. And I also want to thank my dear friend Bob Santelli from the Grammy Museum, who is always here hosting this event. We couldn't do these, these workshops without uh, Bob and his team, so we are once again grateful that uh, he's making this part of the music series possible. And this part involves some of the most special guests who are here, uh, you guys. We have students from so many different parts of the country. This is really a diverse group. Hawaii, Oregon, California, Minnesota, and Ohio, Mississippi, Tennessee, Pennsylvania, New York, Maryland, of course, right here in DC. You guys are from everywhere. And just so that you know, we are in the state dining room, and this is where we host presidents and kings and queens and ambassadors and world leaders and a lot happens in this room and now we're hosting you. And we're so excited to have you here because this is really my favorite part of these music series. It's like tonight we have a great concert that's gonna happen with a lot of fancy people that will show up. But today, these artists take time out of their day to be with you guys and it is fitting that we have such a diverse group of students for this event because today we're celebrating the kind of music that makes you move no matter who you are or where you come from. Music that taps into feelings and experiences that we all share. Love and heartbreak, pride and doubt, tragedy and triumph. It is called soul music. Can we say that soul music? Soul, soul music. Sometimes it makes your hips move. <laughs> Sometimes it makes you just rock your head. Just mm -hmm. Sometimes it helps you just kick back and relax and soak it in. But no matter what form it comes in, you know this music always comes straight from the heart. You know you're listening to someone who's found her own unique voice and isn't afraid to show it to the world. And these women are perfect examples of just that. For instance, Melissa says that when she first started writing songs, she wrote a few that helped her get through some struggles she was facing, songs that helped her get some things off of her chest. But she didn't think anyone wanted to hear these songs, so when she was up on stage, she'd mostly play those fun, bouncy melodies that she had heard on the radio that sounded oh so wonderful, right? But then after one of the shows, or many of the shows, folks started coming up and talking to her about those other songs, the ones she'd written herself. And this, she said this about those songs. She said, the songs that people responded to, they were always the songs that were deeply personal to me. She said, and I thought, that must be the key, if I can make my songs resonate with emotions and truthfulness. That is Melissa. She will tell you more about her world. And then there's Miss Patti LaBelle. Her story, just short and sweet, before she'd won any Grammys or sold any records, Miss Patti LaBelle was the shyest little girl around. It is hard to believe that. 
She was afraid to even ask her teacher if she could use the bathroom. Oh, <laughs> and she never dreamed of singing in front of people unless she was part of a full choir. But once she mustered up enough courage to sing a solo in church and she got a standing ovation. Mm. And as she says now, she says, I still have a little bit of shyness. I look back and say, thank God I got through it and took chances and sang my butt off. <laughs> and then there's Janelle Monet. When she was growing up, her mom was a janitor. Her stepfather worked for the post office and her father was a garbage collector. When Janelle was first trying to make it in New York, she worked a side job as a maid to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. When she moved to Atlanta, she worked at an office supply store. And today, even though she's a huge star, she's never lost sight of where she came from. Now, wherever she goes, she almost always wears a black and white jacket and pants. <laughs> and she calls this her uniform. And it's a tribute to her mother and so many other folks who taught her the value of hard work, folks who wore a uniform to work every single day. Mm -hmm. And she says, now, I didn't have to change who I was. I didn't have to become perfect because I've learned through my journey that perfection is often the enemy of greatness. Mm -hmm. Embrace what makes you unique, even if it makes others feel uncomfortable. So to all of you young people here, I want you to listen to those lessons not just the ones I read, but the ones you're gonna hear from these women when they talk to you. Embrace what makes you unique. Take some risks, please take some risks. Find your own voice and be proud of it. And then sing your butt off. <laughs> or work your butt off. Or whatever you do, do it until your butt comes off. <laughs> okay, that, that quote's gonna be kind of funny in the papers. I already know it. My communications people are like, what? <laughs> well, you guys all know what I meant. <laughs> Be good at what you do. And if you pair those lessons with a good education, yes. all right, if you challenge yourself in school, get that degree or professional training, but you got to do more than just graduate from high school. That's not good enough anymore. So you gotta go beyond. Then you can become a great artist or an entrepreneur or a scientist or anything else that you wanna be in this world, but your education is key. That's the story of anyone who has ever been successful, whether it's Barack or me or your parents and teachers or these three women up here today. Uh, at one time or another, we all had to find our own voices and show the world what we have inside. And uh, I really want you all to take that to heart, you know, because part of giving you these experiences is so that you understand how special you are, you know, and there are millions of young people like you all, and because we get to highlight you here, we get to show the world and remind the world that our future lies with you all, but you, we need you to be ready, we need you to be focused, we need you to take your education seriously, mm -hmm. and we need you to not be afraid to work hard. You will fail, we have all failed at something, and it's been big, embarrassing failures. But we all rise above it, and we expect that from you all. So this is the first in many wonderful experiences I know you all will have, so take advantage of it. We're gonna get rid of the press so that you feel comfortable, shake it off, make sure you ask questions, don't be afraid. This is your home, this is your house. So treat it that way. Take some risks now, stand up and use your voice and ask a question, don't be shy, uh, and learn something. Be open to taking whatever you can in and then use it uh, to be the best that you can be. We are so excited to have you here. I know you're gonna have a great time with these women. They are excited as Patti LaBelle she says, she said, I am honored to be here with these students. Mm -hmm. And that's how we all feel. We are honored to be in your presence. Just keep doing what you do. Be good, be great, all right? So I'm gonna leave you. I'm gonna go do some more work. And uh, I, well, look, look, okay? I, you're in good hands, all right? Thanks for coming to the White House. You guys have fun, all right.
How about another round for the First Lady, huh? Thank you. Okay, that was pretty amazing, wasn't it? Yeah. Pretty amazing. And the words of wisdom are not just for you, but for all of America, all of young America. And some of those same themes and some of those same topics we can see in the history of American music especially in soul music, like I'm about to talk to you in just a minute. But before I do, let me introduce myself for those of you who don't know who I am and for those out in the rest of America, because this is being streamed to high schools all over America. My name is Bob Santelli, and I'm the executive director of the Grammy Museum in downtown Los Angeles. And for the past three or four years, we have been coming here to the White House, bringing students like you from all over the country to not just experience the excitement and, and just really amazing feeling you get when you walk into this house, but also, and even more importantly, to learn about how this great American music form that we celebrate and love and enjoy and bring into our hearts every day is so important to us as Americans. I always like to say that when we talk about American music, it's pretty hard not to define ourselves as Americans without talking about music. It's such an important part of who we are. And it really doesn't matter what kind of music is your favorite or your parents' favorite or your grandparents. The fact is that Americans are so connected to a great, great tradition of music in this country. And it really goes way back. It goes way beyond the time of now. It goes back to the earliest days, before we were even a country, actually, when we started to take the music of Africa and take the music of Europe and put them together into a particular ma mesh so that what comes out was uniquely and distinctly American. Now, one of the great music forms, without question, that came out of that mix is something called soul music. Soul music is an interesting, in my view, it may be the most powerful music form, vocal music form, that we've ever created. Now, you could say gospel. What about gospel? And of course, gospel. But soul music comes out of gospel. The word soul is an interesting word. Why did we call it soul music? What does it mean if someone says to you, boy, you have soul, or, or that singer has soul? What does that mean? Anybody? What does that mean? Yes, sir. Say it. That's right. It speaks to others. It speaks to others in a very powerful, emotional way. Soul music, when you sing soul, yeah, you have something to say. That's right. That's right. This is a reflection. When you sing soul music, it is a reflection, a deep, intense reflection of who you are inside. Not anyone can sing soul music. You have to have the talent, but you also have to have the confidence to be able to let those inner emotions come out and sing absolutely truthfully from the heart. Now, where does it come from? So how do we get soul music? And when does it first come onto the American scene? Since World War II, we have been awash with great American music. Actually, if you go back even farther than that, go back to the turn of the century, last century. We had jazz, we had blues, we had gospel, we had rhythm and blues. We had country music. We had rock and roll. We had all kinds of jazz, by the way. We had swing and Dixieland and big band and bop and hard bop and cool. We had all kinds of rock and roll. You can imagine what this tree, if this were a tree, an American music tree, what it would look like. It would be a giant oak tree filled with many branches because that is the wealth and the diversity of the American music form. Well, after World War II, especially in African-American churches, gospel becomes a very, very important part, not just of the religious service, but it also becomes a part of self-identity. And gospel music then leaves the church, gradually leaves the church, because many of the great singers, and you'll hear about this in just a minute, but many of the great singers learned to sing, first and foremost, in the church. African-American music tradition was extremely powerful and important and still is in the African-American church. So to get that training and to understand how to sing powerfully and emotionally about your Lord Savior, whoever that might be, and be able to project that, that's pretty important. 
So that makes you want to sing and sing hard and powerfully. That, over time, starts to take go out of the church and go into pop music. So in the 1950s and early 1960s, there are some really tremendous singers. Maybe some of you have heard of the late Sam Cooke, late great Sam Cooke. Man, he could sing gospel and he sure could sing pop music as well. One of the first soul, one of the very, very first soul singers. Unfortunately, he leaves us in the early 1960s, but what a sound he gives us. And then there are people like James Brown. There's people like Ray Charles. Many, many others. A woman who is going to be with us tonight across the, across the building, Aretha Franklin, learns how to sing in the church. So if you were African American and you learned how to sing in the church, you had a leg up because there was so much of that great singing going on. But now it starts to come into pop music around the late 50s and early 1960s. I like to say that no music form is ever born. It's not like something just kind of pops up one day and all of a sudden we have rock and roll or jazz. It never works like that. It's an evolution. It gradually comes out of the church and gradually goes into the streets and the schools and the living rooms and bedrooms and where kids practice in front of mirrors and learn to sing. And the lyrics start to change. Not the style necessarily. The style is still pretty gospel. But the lyrics start to change. Instead of talking just about the love of Jesus and salvation, now we start to sing about love, a different kind of love, a love between two people. And so, or things that are going on in the world. So the idea of singing very powerfully and emotionally gets taken from the church, it comes into the pop charts. And wow, you talk about great music, it's hard to beat what happens in the 1960s, which is the great decade for soul music. I could go uh, make lists for you of great soul singers because basically anyone who recorded for Motown, we all know Motown out of Detroit, great soul singers. There were others like Stax and Volt out of Memphis, Tennessee, great soul singers coming out of there and from New York and from Los Angeles, literally from every major city, soul singers were coming up through the church and then coming into the pop realm and making a big difference in how America sounded and how America felt about itself. The interesting thing is there were men and there were women. This is Women's History Month, and today and tonight we're celebrating the women of soul music. Why that is important is because of this. Most of the 20th century, when rock and roll and pop and funk and everything was coming up, most of the artists were male. It was just the way it was. Women only got the chance to vote in the early part of the century. So when it came to the business of the music, it was really difficult sometimes for women to make it. But in soul music, quite honestly, they couldn't be denied. They were that good, the singing was that powerful, and the public, not just church-going people now, but people buying records, white, Latino, black, it didn't matter. All of America began to embrace this thing called soul music. You couldn't resist it. You couldn't, you just couldn't resist it. And it wasn't just in America either, because what happens is this music starts to go to Europe. It starts to go to South America. It goes to the Caribbean. It becomes not just America's music anymore. It becomes world music. So much of American music. Now you can go to Chile today and hear a great soul singer who's never even been to America. You can go to Spain. You could go to any place in Asia, and there are people who sing soul music, and they sing emotionally, and they copy the greats, but what they're doing is they're expressing themselves musically in their hearts through their voice, and that's a very, very powerful thing, and today that tradition goes on. We have great soul singers. We have people now who have taken the golden age of soul in the 1960s and taken into a completely different direction today. People like Janelle Monet, Beyonce, and others who are really singing things that perhaps they wouldn't have sang, wouldn't have sung back in the 60s, but now they're keeping the music forward. One of the most important things for music to grow and to remain vital to us is that young people like yourselves, from this group, Hope Leader of Soul Singers, who will come up and you'll give your version of soul music as you reach maturity as an artist. And you'll give us yet a new version of soul music with a new sensibility. The women of soul music gave us a female sensibility. You could hear Sam Cooke sing 
and it was, his point of view was male. He was telling you how he felt and how he felt about the world or how the world was treating him through a male point of view. But now, with the rise of the female soul singer, we get a female point of view. And that was very, very important in the 1960s because it's really in the 1960s when women start to assert their rights, women's rights, saying, look, we want to be equal to men. And of course, how could you not forget the importance of soul music and gospel, but soul music too, in the civil rights movement of the 1960s. I think it's safe to say that if you took music away from the civil rights movement, movement I don't know whether it would have succeeded because what that soul music and, and gospel music gave to those young people, even older people on the lines, when you're facing barking German shepherds or firemen with very heavy duty hoses ready to hose you down or police with billy clubs, and you need to keep your courage, that music, soul and gospel, first cousins, they gave those, those young people the courage to fight for rights. Powerful, powerful thing that happened in America back then. You weren't around, but your grandparents remember that. And if you've seen the movie The Butler, okay, you know what that was all about. Very powerful experience, and music played a very, very important part of that. So today, as we continue, the idea is for soul now, for those of us who've enjoyed soul and been involved in soul music, really what happens, it gets passed to you, to your generation. Now it's your time to put your stamp on this great American music form, and in this month, especially the women in here, to think about how music affects you and why it affects you, to understand music that you listen to so you become more sophisticated listeners and you are able to bring that music deeper in. And if you are singers, and I know many of you are singers and musicians here, you get a chance to let it come back out for all of us to share and to learn from and to benefit from. That is what makes soul music so great. Now I could go on and on and on, and I'm not, because I have three very distinguished guests here. And what I'd like to do at this particular point is I'm going to ask each of them a question about their early days. And we'll kind of warm up a little bit, and then I'm going to allow you to ask some of the questions as well, okay? So when you do get a chance, please make sure that you stand up, speak loudly so we can all hear you up here, give us your name, your school, and your state so that we can know where you're from, okay? So I'd just like to start, Melissa, I'd like to start with you because I kept talking about um, growing up in African-American churches and how important this was. And of course, you, I don't think you grew up in an African-American church, yeah. but you are considered to be a great soul singer and you are the exact reason why you're here is to tell us how music really, soul music and all forms of music actually transcend color and race, a perfect example. Absolutely, I grew up in the state of Kansas, which is right in the middle of our wonderful country. Yeah. And it was in the 60s, just like he was saying, when this amazing boom came. I was born in 1961. So as a child, we had one radio station, WHB. It was one AM radio station. And that station played everything. I could hear a Tammy Wynette song. Mm -hmm. Then I could hear Led Zeppelin. Then I could hear Marvin Gaye, yeah. all on one station. I, I didn't have those. You know, they, they weren't you know blocked off. I, I was able to listen to Aretha Franklin at a young age and was incredibly moved. I also, my first music was in the church. It was the Methodist church. We were much more <laughs> uh, straight, reserved. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> reserved, let's say that. They were much more reserved, yeah. yet music played a great part, the spiritual part of music. So I could relate when, when my parents uh, bought an Aretha Franklin album and I heard her sing Bridge Over Troubled Waters and it brought me to my knees. Yeah. I understood that emotion. So as I became a writer, as I became a, a musician, I wanted to bring that in. I, I never thought, oh, I'm white, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, I'm a human being, right. and I feel this. I want to express this. And, and like the first lady said, oh my gosh. <laughs> like, like she said, I would get responses to that. It would, people would say, that song, that moves me. And I realized, that that universal experience goes past skin, yeah. goes yeah. past age, goes past everything. Soul is called soul music because it has to do with each of our souls. That's right. Patty, 
obviously you grow up in the African-American community and in church, and you are, when it comes to legends, you're one of them. You help define the kind of music that you listen to and I listen to and many of us still listen to. Talk about your early roots and how you get started in singing. Oh, well, gosh. <coughs> I'm sorry. I was born in 1944. I'm 69, I'll be 70, May 24th. Mm -hmm. So I'm like an original gangster. <laughs> <aren't you? laughs> back, way back in the day, I was uh, very shy. So I sang in front of my mirror with a broom as a microphone. And I sang and sang and sang. And my mother one day said, what did she call me? I don't know. <laughs> she called me baby baby, you should start singing in the church. And so I said, okay. And so I went to my church and my uh, musical director, uh, choir director, Miss uh, Chapman, Miss Harriet Chapman, uh, heard me singing with a group of about 30 people and she could hear my voice and she said, mm, Miss Patty, you need to sing out front. You need to do solos. And I said, no, no, <laughs> I don't do no <laughs> solo. Mm -hmm. Then she said, well, what about my son? Her son, I'm gonna make it quick too. My son, um, oh, what was her son's name? He's gone on the glory. Uh, he's Nathan. He sang a duo with me, a duet. And it was a song called God Specializes. Uh, and he'll do anything, anything in the power he will do. In the song, I got a standing ovation with her son. And so I said, hallelujah. So this is time for me to realize that I have something that touches people, and it doesn't matter who you are, what race, what uh, religion, what gender, uh, straight, gay, whatever, whoever. Um, I sing, and I've been singing all this time to touch people. Yeah. And as you said, young man, it not only touches you, it touches me. Hey, mm. it touches us. It gives me the power to continue. Last night I did something and I said I could sing. I said to Ken Ehrlich, I could sing for three more hours mm -hmm. because God has blessed me with this. It don't cost me nothing mm -hmm. to sing. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do mm -hmm. because I can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Janelle, what about you, the early roots? I grew up in Kansas too. Oh yes, Kansas City, Kansas, Wyandotte County. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just finding this out. Um, yeah. So I, I, I grew up in church as well, Baptist. And the training that I had was living room training, I like to call it. When you get in your living room and you have your mama, daddy, whether it's a holiday, it could just be a Saturday, a Monday, or no, we're at school, right? Um, but we would all get in the living room and just sing. And I would sing and my parents be sitting on the couch. Sometimes they'd be like, girl, go in your room. <laughs> We're trying to watch TV. Um, and I shared a room with my sister for pretty much all of my childhood. And she would, you know, constantly be annoyed with me singing. And, you know, like Stevie Wonder says, music is a world within itself with a language people all, we all understand. That's what I believe. And I've always, um, you know, love communicating through song. And I remember I gave, I sang something at church and someone said, you gave me goosebumps. And I didn't know, I was like eight, nine. I didn't know what that meant. But I just, my goal was to keep giving people goosebumps. <laughs> and that's what I would keep trying to do, right? And so through, through that language, you know, that was the only way they, I couldn't talk to them. I mean, maybe a story, but I found that, um, you know, music is, has really just been a part of my DNA and singing, you know, just uh, who I am. And, and um, my both sides of my family, I grew up Baptist on one side, and the other side was Seven Day Adventist. So it was a little bit more, um, I don't want to say professional worshiping, <laughs> but it, it was, if you will. And uh, we did a lot of classical, you know, hymns. And then my other side was real raw, more kind of James Brown, screaming, hollering. So I would get both those sides and I started to incorporate that when I started to become, when I wanted to be a songwriter, I would want to incorporate, incorporate those styles in my music. You know, go from something like a Judy Garland to um, something like a Patty or a Tina Turner, you know, just something that was raw but then sweet. Uh, so yeah, I just, I, I've, you know, to this day, I, I thank um, the creator 
who is the consummate artist, uh, in my opinion. And, you know, he helps us creatives stay flowing, our juices flowing and, and allowing us to write these songs. And all I think, you know, we all want to do is just keep giving back, yeah. keep reciprocating, you know. You know, the First Lady talked about having a dream, you know, especially for you guys to have dreams and to go after your dreams. I presume all three of you had a dream at some point when you realized you did have a God-given talent. How does that dream materialize into an actual goal where you actually say, you know what, I'm going to make my life entertainment. I'm going to be a singer, and I'm going to pursue that. Do you remember when that was? Melissa, how, how did that happen? Well, yes, at very young. I think when you're extremely young, 8, 9, 10, you have dreams, yeah. and, and you don't have the weight of, oh, you can't do right, it. You know, right, you're, right. You, although when I was eight and I'd say, I want to be a singer, people would go, really? Mm -hmm. Yet, um, and then as you get a little older, people are like, well, it's only one in a million. You know, mm -hmm. they, they, they yeah. kind of start to, to, you know, soften you for the blow or something. Yet, it's that desire, even when someone says, well, you might not make it, are you prepared for that? When inside, that dream says, oh, no, this is, what I, this is the only thing I want to do. Mm -hmm. And it's what gets you up in the morning. It's right. what keeps you alive. That dream is what we're all here to do. You gotta have a dream, you gotta create. Don't, you don't have to be a huge star, but you've got to create something in, in this life every day. Yeah. That's what moves you forward. Yeah. Patty, how about you? I am um, a believer. I've never been told not to. Mm -hmm. And had I been told not to, I'm still gonna do it because yeah. I know I can. Yeah. I met five or seven or eight little girls in the hotel last night in the lobby. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And, and there, I didn't know you were here today. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so these little girls said, Miss LaBelle, oh God, we're so happy to meet you. I said, oh, I'm happy to meet you too, boo. And so they said, we sing. Yeah. I said, oh, really? And so I said, sing. Yeah. Right on the spot. That's right. Those little heifers sang. <laughs> the, they sang. Yeah the national anthem, right? right? Yeah. And what did I say after you finished? Because Miss Thing, one yeah. of them, yeah. you with the beautiful, strong voice, realized that it was too high for her to go to near the end. Go ahead. And then baby girl right there, <laughs> you. Yeah. What did you do? But you believed that you could, and you finished it. So I believe that nobody can tell you nothing about what you can or cannot do. Sing in a God darn hotel lobby. Sing in the airport. Wherever you feel it, God has blessed you and touched by an angel you are. Yeah. And I will kick you in your throat if you don't sing. <laughs> don't <leave the> <laughs> I, I was in the lobby when that happened. Oh, and for those of you who weren't there, Tell you guys started singing. And then the whole place kind of stood, you know, just uh, they're like <laughs> something very official was happening. The front desk stopped and everyone just Because stopped. God has blessed these ladies. And most great. of you in here are blessed. Yeah. Don't ever stop your dream. Kick face, boo. Okay? <laughs> Look at her crying now. Cry, baby. Good. Cry those tears. <laughs> Keep crying. <laughs> I'm sorry. Janelle, <laughs> your oh, dream. That, that I know you had. This was moving. This you was had very, a dream as well. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, I, I had a dream in Kansas City, Kansas. Wind up, and I grew up in one of the poorest counties in Kansas City, so my parents were working day and night, turning nothing into something. And uh, music was therapy at a young age, and it kept me, you know, sane. It kept me. Uh, thinking about a future where I could uh, make my parents proud yeah. and do things because I love doing them, not because we had to do yeah. them. Right. And so I just set my parents down. I told them at like a young age, I need to be in talent showcases. I need to do this, you know, please support me. And they never ever told me, you know, that I should be doing yeah. something else. I just, of course I had to keep my grades right. Mm -hmm. I had to make sure I was, getting all my A's, um, and I was, I was. I was very active in school. And so, you know, throughout doing the talent showcases, I 
got to audition for a school in New York, the American Musical and Dramatics Academy, and I had great teachers who encouraged me, and they saw something in me, and I ended up getting the scholarship, and um, you know, it, it kind of helped me along my yeah. way. But it was through mentoring, community service is so important because if I didn't have those old, you know, older teachers saying, yeah, we're gonna write you a recommendation, or work on this, or just do this a little better, I don't think that I would have had the confidence mm -hmm. to go all the way to New York and audition for a school. Mm -hmm. So I think it, the, what we're doing today, and I mean, I know, I hope that you guys understand how much we want to be here because somebody did that in our lives. Right. And we understand that we're nothing without community and help and prayers and encouragement. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> now it's your turn to ask some questions. Who would like to ask a question? Yes, ma'am. Hello, my name is Mariah Hunt. I'm with Youth Villages. I attend North Carolina A&T State University in Greensboro, North Carolina. And my question is, um, when you realized that you were becoming a superstar, what was the biggest internal conflict that you had and how did you overcome that? Good question. Nice question. <laughs> <laughs> Who are Sam? you talking to, boo? <laughs> 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 Are you adjusting this to you? This is right here. Okay. All right. Pick one. Go, Melissa. Patty, you want to take it? Go, All right, Melissa. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, it, it's funny. The the when you realize you're a superstar is usually long after you become one, because it is such a it's something that happens in the public and not necessarily to you. You, we. You're, we're doing what we love. We're doing it every day. We're playing in bars, we're playing in clubs, we're playing, and pretty soon you notice, hey, the audiences are getting larger. <laughs> and my, my experience actually took, uh, it wasn't until my fourth album that I was considered you know, a big star in the 90s. And it's, it's, it's funny because I always thought when I was younger, oh, I'm gonna be a star, I'm gonna be rich and famous, and all my problems are gonna be taken care of, right? That's not how it works at all. You are, st we, I am still me, and I have always been me, and the same, the, th the same things that, that make me happy still make me happy, the same things that make me sad, the, thing, the same things that I worry about, the, the biggest obstacle. M mine was my, my sexuality. I, I came out in the 90s and <laughs> when not many people were doing that. And that was probably the, the scariest part. Of, I, I didn't want this fame without being exactly who I was, 100%. So doing that, and then I went from selling a million albums to selling six million albums after I came out. So that, was, that, that showed me that being myself, absolutely myself, all the way to the core, means not only do I get to share that, but everything that comes back, it gets to go all the way in, and I get to... I get to appreciate it all the way down to my toes and go, yes, I did that, and that's what the world is seeing. And, it, and it's still ongoing. We're still, we don't, we're up here, and I'm, I mean, I speak for myself, and I imagine it's, it's like this everywhere. We don't get up and go, I'm a superstar, you know? <laughs> no, <laughs> we get up, and we're, and we're mothers, and we're sisters, and daughters, mm -hmm. and, and we have lives, and we have loved ones, and we want that life. We, and that's very important to us. And probably the hardest thing now is just balance yeah. with that. Come on. Yes. My name's Sadie Little, and I am here representing Eddieville Charter School on the Oregon Coast. And my question is, what are the key components of composing soul music? Mm, good question. What did you say, Bill? The key. <laughs> what are the key components of composing soul music? <laughs> well. I believe that you have to, first of all, have soul, yeah. okay? You could be white, black, it doesn't matter, straight, gay. You can compose from your soul, and if it's your soul, like Adele, she's a beautiful, big old white woman, okay? <laughs> now, does she have that soul? And she composes, and she does it all, and I do believe that you have to believe that you are not stunted. A lot of people, feel as though they're stunted, their growth, their belief in themselves, because if somebody tells you, you ain't got soul, then you're gonna feel that. Do you see? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, 
But I believe that it comes from within, and it doesn't matter who you are. You know, my mailman has soul, and he's a big old white man, okay? <laughs> and he sings when he brings my mail. I said, boo, you better work that trick. <laughs> so that's my answer. Yeah, that's good. All right. Yes, sir, in the back. so much. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. In the back, yes. Hi, my name is Dara Hall. I'm representing Youth Villages. I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, and I go to the University of Memphis. And this question is for Ms. Janelle Monet. Um, the title of your last album was The Electric Lady, and I just want to know, how did you come up with that term? Mm -hmm. um, the Electric Lady was, was inspired by... Um, the change that I wanted to see around the world. And uh, my paintings actually inspired her. I paint and sing sometimes when I perform. And so I started to paint this image of this female. And I did this every night. And so I did not understand why I was painting this image. And I was encouraged by friends and family to put together all the paintings I painted over the course of my three month tour and do like a gallery showing or something. And I was trying to come up with a name, and I was like, what am I going to call her? And I had a hard time, so I knew that whoever this being was, this woman was, that she didn't want to be marginalized. She didn't want me to categorize her. And what spoke out to me, I guess what I felt, I had this visceral reaction, the words, the electric lady came out. And so I said, you know, this is uh, a woman who is um, she's redefining what it means you know, to be a 21st century woman. Uh, she's bold, she's audacious, and she is the change that she wants to see. It doesn't matter what her skin color is, her hair texture, she is the change that she wants to see in her community, and she uses her superpowers for good. And so that really inspired the title. Mm -hmm. right. Take one more question, yes sir. Uh, my name is Tyler Golson. I'm from the Sherwood High School in Maryland here. And my question is specifically for Ms. Monet, but uh, can apply to all three of you. Uh, you had a performance on television recently where your band was all female. What's the importance to you of uh, females not only singing, but also playing this music as well? Oh, it's uh, important that as an artist, and especially as a female artist, that we remain in control of our bodies, of our image, of our songwriting, um, and how we envision music. I think that being a woman, we have a very unique position in this world. We have the ability to be leaders and be strong, but also the ability to embrace our compassionate sides, which I think we can sometimes lack as human beings. But I think women have that um, um, very unique position. They, you know, they can go from sassy and all these different things, but they, it's something that we, we, ha we have the motherly thing. Like whenever I'm with uh, my auntie Patty, my mama, <laughs> she's just, when I'm in her presence, she just makes me feel like everything's gonna be okay. Mm -hmm. And I think if we had more women in these positions and more female A&Rs even, mm -hmm. I think that you will see the world get a lot better. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. I just wanna create the change that I wanna see. So when you see visuals from me, this is what I wanna see. You know, I don't want to complain about it, just do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we've talked a lot about music. How about we hear some, right? <laughs> yes. wow. okay. All right, is my mic even working? Hello, there it is. I've never played the piano in the White House. This is amazing. Okay. <laughs> when, I, when I knew that I was going to be performing for you guys, I thought, I mean, I went through the 100 million soul songs, right? And I, I, I went through my own history, mm -hmm. sort of like our fellow here did. And I realized, of course, that soul music came from gospel, which came from blues, which came from that, uh, 
that you know turn of the century the the the, the slave music and then the blues the rich blues that came out from that and so I went back to to about 1930s when the blues songs were starting to become actually popular music these great singers uh, Ethel Waters was one of the first yes absolutely uh, yeah these great singers who then bridged this this raw bluesy music into the popular music of that time and here's a song born of the blues tradition sort of that that lost love that oh what am I gonna do but it was sung by Billie Holiday Etta James my favorite rendition is Lena Horne now there's somebody who ah, who could really sing some gorgeous soul music this is stormy weather all right don't know why There's no sun up in the sky. Stormy weather. <laughs> Since my man and I ain't together. Lord, it keeps raining all, all the time. Life is bare, oh, life is bare. Gloom and misery everywhere. Stormy weather. Since my baby and I ain't together. Oh, it keeps raining, it keeps raining all the time. Ah, oh, since he went away, oh, the blues, they're out to get me. Ah, oh, if he stays away, oh, rocking chair is going to get me. And every day I pray the Lord above, the Lord above will let me get out and walk in the sun. Once again, I can't go on, no. Everything I have is gone. Stormy weather, my baby, my baby and I, we ain't together. No, 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 it keeps raining. It keeps raining all the time. Oh, oh this is sweet. Thank you. This is Terrence Brown, my accompaniment. Uh, what are we going to do? Oh, yeah. So when I wrote this song, I imagined it being sung in church. And it's a personal testimony for me because, you know, in the process of trying to figure out what you want to say next on maybe an album or what you feel like is missing, what can, how can I contribute to, you know, society and to music, um, you go through doubt, and I went through doubt in this song, and the message in this song, if y'all can be my church for a little bit, the message, the sermon would be, to be victorious, you must find glory in the little things. <laughs> so we're going to go a little slow. Yeah, slower. We're going to slow it down. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. 
Today I feel so troubled deep inside. I wish the tears would roll back in my eyes. Will I rise? Oh, I'll keep singing songs until the pain goes. If loving you means fighting till the end, then I'll fight harder, baby, just to win. And if tomorrow shall come to me, I'll count your every kiss as a victory. Because to be victorious, you must find glory in the little things. To be victorious, you must find glory in the little things. Surrounded by the schemes and senseless lies And blaming others, feeling victimized Oh, tomorrow, one day they'll know To win you have to lose all the things you know Yes, Lord I tried to light the fire deep inside. Father, take all the fears and sorrow from my life. Because when the rain falls, my seed will grow. And I'll be further to my dreams tomorrow. Because to be victorious, you must find glory in the little things. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? To be victorious, you must find glory in the little things. One more time, Terrence. Because to be victorious, oh, Lord, you must find glory in the little things, the little things. To be victorious, you must find glory in the little things, because there's a greater, greater, greater love. There's a great love in the little things. There's a great love in the little things. Because to be victorious, you must find glory in the little, the little things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Wow. That was amazing. That was amazing. Okay. Oh. All right. So, Can I sing? what do we think? I wasn't asked to sing, oh, but no. <laughs> no, because no, they were so kind uh, in asking me to be on the panel. And when they said my baby girl was going to sing and my baby girlfriend was going to sing, <laughs> I said, but nobody asked Miss Pietty. So I'm going to sing. Uh, I don't play piano, nor do I want a piano. I'm going to sing. All right.
our Father who art in heaven, hallowed would be thy Cheats in heaven, oh, in heaven, heaven, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us. Forgive our debtors. And then somebody says, as we forgive our debtors. Hell, <laughs> lead us not into temptation, but deliver us, deliver all of us from evil. in this world and we have to say forever everybody say Someone have a question? What? Hold on, hold on, Patty. Just hold on one second here. Okay. We got one question here. Okay. Yes. What's your question? Where go back and pick yeah. <laughs>
Thank you, guys. Great audience. Janelle Monet, Patty LaBelle. Thank you. We'll see you again next time.